Hello and welcome to episode 8 of my offline series. Today we're going to be talking about a uh, little thing called lane equilibrium. Essentially what it means is that the offlane starts in a losing position. You start with the lane up here. This is not a very good place for the lane to be. Uh, obviously it's close to the tower. They're going to be getting the extra armor, extra regen. If you dive them, it's difficult. If they want to go back, it's easy. If they want to chase you, there's a lot of uh, distance for you to run before you get to safety, right? So essentially, the, in a nutshell, what I'd say is that it's the offlane's job to rescue themselves out of the difficult situation and start playing aggressively. If you think about it, um, the carry heroes are always going to be weaker, right? Um, the pos 4s are usually about as strong as the pos 5, I'd say, generally. The pos 3 is usually a lot stronger than the pos 1. The reason why I see a lot of offlane games are going badly is because they're just playing up here the whole time. Now, this is the main advantage of the safe lane and why it's called the safe lane, because you end up with the creeps so much closer to your tower. They get easy levels, they get easy last hits, and they just start pressuring you with like level advantage or gold advantage. That's not something you want to happen. You play a stronger hero, you want to really sort of um, exert your strength, right? You want to make the enemy carry feel sad. So in this case, I'm playing Sand King plus Lina against Spectre. This is obviously a very easy lane for us as long as the Spectre doesn't free farm under his tower. So the first thing is consider the fact that you want the lane to be in a good place. So don't level Corsic Finale, don't use Sandstorm Willy Nini. Try to not hit the creeps if possible. In this case, I start off the lane with a stun. I hit all the creeps, which isn't great because it pushes the lane in. However, this does so much damage that I think it's worth it. And you'll see later on how I do what I do to resolve the situation essentially. Because the lane is already getting pushed in, I decide I want to push it in a little bit more. Because I know at 14 seconds my Lena can pull the large camp to the wave, which will pull the aggro back. And um, I want the I want the, the creeps to be under my the Spectre's tower, essentially. Um, if the creeps are under Spectre's tower. He can't go help his Grimstroke contest this pool, and me and Lena can kill Grimstroke if he comes. Now, in this case, the Grimstroke actually goes to pull his own small camp, but this is still good for us in the long run, because the small, large camp pool is better than the small camp pool. So I'm just here sapping XP. You can see that Spectre is um, having to play up here. This is 100 times better than playing up here, uh, over here. So we get a stun on him. I'm just running away because I'm too low on health in this case. But you see, if I had more health, we could have maybe killed him here. And now the lane is going to reset here. This is a very good place for the lane to be. Um, essentially, I'm just going to be getting a lot of free denies, right? He's kind of scared to walk up to the lane unless he's on very good health. Otherwise, we're just going to stun into stun on him. See, I'm, I'm even holding a point right now. This is something that's very important. Don't level skills until you need them. I see so many people, they start the game with a skill. Like, what's the point? If I start the game with Caustic Finale, if I can get a kill here, maybe I change my mind and I want to level stun. Same when you get more levels. You only level a skill when you have to use it. Right now, I'm thinking, do I go 2 and W? Maybe the lane progresses in a way where my Lina just feeds here for no reason. I want 2 and W, I cut behind the tower. Do I want a point in E? Maybe my Lina feeds and I think, you know, I have to do something different. If my If we keep continue playing well, I probably want 2 and stun. But, you see, like, right now, I see an opportunity. I'm thinking maybe we can kill this Grimstroke. He's kind of low, right? And he's out of position as well. We land a stun on Grim. And now, in my mind, I'm thinking I have to get another point in Q to increase my range, increase the stun duration. I end up walking into this a little bit. I end up doing a two-man stun. And I have the W as well. Because I think that this lane's progressing very well. I don't want to be pushing out the way for no reason. So right now, with the lane here, it's like checkmate, right, for, for the Spectre. Like, what can he do? If he walks up here, he's going to take a million damage every time. If he stays up here, he's not going to be getting any last hits. You can see I'm already pulling ahead very heavily in terms of CS. All my Lina has to do now is stop the Grim from pulling, which is pretty much what he's doing. But at the same time, if you don't stop the Grim from pulling, you can also play really aggressive every time. So the Grim is now doing a single pull. But over here, his Spectre is just getting fucking punished. He ends up having to salve his Spectre. So right now, again, we push out the lane. but And they pull small camp. But again, we have another large camp that we can be pulling. 
which is, uh, oh, I guess he goes to contest the rune. I end up pulling the remnants of their small camp pool. All single pools end up pushing the wave. So as long as you punish them during the pool, you also punish them after the pool. So again, the lane is getting pushed out. I'm just denying or trying to my best, right? The lane is again pushed out. Every time the lane is pushed out, we go on Spectre. Finally, this time, he we have a little bit more levels. We have a little bit more damage. He ends up dying. So this is an example of how having the creeps in a good place can help you win the game, essentially. Now, apart from large camp pools and small camp pools and all these things, there is another thing you can do, which is um, cutting the creeps. So let me just show you an example of this. Um, in this game, which I think I've shown before, um, I'm playing Tidehunter against Ursa. Uh, in this case, I have a tiny position 4 who is not really going to be helping me out too much in the lane, right? So we have to come up with a way to fix the equilibrium without relying on small camp pools and big camp pools because every time he goes to pull this camp, they're probably just going to kill him. We're not stronger like in the Spectre game or the Sanking game. So when the game starts, I make sure that I'm healthy and I make sure that I have enough HP to contest um, them over here. So the lane starts, right? Immediately. I'm doing I'm making sure that I'm keeping both of them here sometimes what you can do if you want to make this a little bit easier you can push out the lane really really hard just like run up to the range creep start hitting it anchor smash and then the creeps go into the tower and the carry can't help his uh, pulse 5 contest over here you can see that my tiny goes over here and he grabs this wave I'm still over here just distracting both of them right he grabs the wave he blocks this large camp with the wave and now he pulls it behind the tower over here now, the creeps are here, he's getting a full wave denied on Ursa, right? And now I'll get to play the 1v1 lane. However, see how I'm, I'm playing while the lane is being pushed. You have to play aggressive because right now, there's a big wave, right? If I don't play aggressive now, if I just go back and I go over here, for example, the Ursa will loop this wave around to here and meet the wave here. And then it's like they have the same situation where I have to go into very deep, dangerous territory. So I continue to pressure him so that he can't just walk past me. And I even um, anchor smash him, right? So now he, he has he's forced to drag the wave on the tower. And I also get to contest him on last hits here as well. See, I'm like constantly pressuring him. I'm like waving my fucking anchor around. Like, even if you don't get the knives, you see it makes it very difficult for him to last it under the tower. This is something that you have to do. If the pulse 5 is here, they miss a full wave. You can play a little bit less aggressive. But it's very important that you don't allow them to pull behind the tower, essentially. A lot of the time, um, I will tank the wave, like here. But because I know that we have another wave coming, I know that this lane is going to get pushed out. Um, or it's going to meet here regardless. So I just tank it on the tower. Something that people too often do at low MMR is that every single opportunity they get, they pull the creeps under the tower. Try to tank it just in front of the tower so that the equilibrium isn't too fucked. Um, I think that's pretty much it for this game. I have another example to show from the position four, um, the position four's point of view, I suppose you can call it. In this game, I was playing OD position four. Um, I understand that as OD, um, it's going to be difficult for me to help my position 3 in lane, right? I'm OD. So what I ended up doing was um, I started with brown boots. This is something that I recommend if you're going to be trying to drive the waves. I start with brown boots and um, I disconnect for a bit, I suppose. Uh, we fight them on the runes. They're not here. Um, right, so the lane starts, immediately I'm hitting the creeps, I'm trying to push it out, right, I even press W on this range creep if I remember correctly, and we're just pushing out the lane, and you see they're like a little bit distracted, and I go over and I drag this wave, you always want to be blocking one of the camps when you're passing by, in this case I block the small camp, on, uh, on Dire it, you can either pull to here, or you can pull to here, on Radiant you generally want to pull here. Because I don't want to run all the way around, and I think that Underlord is kind of going to have a hard time against Void. I feel like I have to fix the wave like a little bit faster. So I put the wave here. You can see he's pressuring him under the tower. Even has some creeps helping him out. And now the lane is reset to here. 
when you do reset the wave as a position four, I recommend that you try not to take too much of this easy XP. Um, you'll see that in a second now, I run over at minute two to contest this. And I'm also going to block the small camp in this case. I end up killing the courier, so I don't block the camp. But you see that my underlord is getting a lot of free XP, right? Because I'm just fighting the oracle off him. Uh, now the wave is a little bit pushed up again, but it's, it's really not, it's not so bad. And they have no access to their small camp. Um, because I'm just here zoning the oracle constantly. I drag another wave, I kill the void. In this case, I drag the wave um, over here again. You see I'm going to tank in front of the tower. This is something that people don't do enough. They just drag it under the tower by accident or something. I tank it under the tower. I help him play the lane here. And now they're, they're having to do pulls, right? I walk over and I contest this pull. Eventually, at minute four, uh, as this OD, I'm going to go contest the bot room. The pug is low here. I imprison him. He gets killed on the tower and he dies. So, keeping the equilibrium in a good place is very, very important. You can see now the Underlord is 25 last hits against 14 with a position 4 OD. And it's not because the Underlord is like some fucking super amazing player. I'm also helping him out a lot. And I've helped out my mid in this case. Um, so, always try to think about how it is that you're going to fix the equilibrium. One thing that you can do is you can drag the three melee creeps onto the range creep and then back again since the first wave. This is something that you should do if you don't trust your position four to help you out. If you can, the best thing you can do is push out the first wave and get your position four to pull the wave somewhere and pressure their carry. And that will fix the equilibrium. The other thing you can do is just rely on hard camp pulls. And this is best if you're playing some kind of really powerful lane where you can really take control of the jungle area. Um, make sure that you communicate to your position for which camps you want blocked, uh, when you want them blocked, if you want them blocked, if you want them dewarded, right? And um, just try and manipulate the aggro in a way that moves the creep towards you at all times. Uh, try not to just pull the creeps under your tower by accident or because you just want to farm them. It's going to hurt you a lot in the long run if the, if the lane bounces back towards the enemy tower. Um, another example. <clears throat> I can show would be uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, I think it's uh, I'm just trying to think when I played this game. I think I played like a Magnus Pos Four or something like that maybe. Um, oh yes, I remember now. So here's uh, here's another example I can show. In this case, um, I'm playing the uh, Earth Spirit. Now, this is a, a little bit of a cheating example, I can say, right? Um, but it just shows the importance of equilibrium. Um, in this case, I can do a lot of um, I can do a lot of things on the map as um, Earth Spirit. But the problem is the Enigma is going to be having a hard time 1v2 against the Slark claim, right? Luckily in this game, I know that the Enigma has an ability which pulls the creeps in, essentially, with the demonic conversion. Every single range creep is going to be getting denied and the lane is going to be pushing in. So the lane starts, I put ward for him just so he can see if the enemy team is pulling and things. I know that his Eidolons can block the creeps if it comes to that. So I start boots, right? I end up getting a little bit low and um, I think pretty much I just run bot and I roll on this Mirana and we kill Mirana. Then I roll on this Axe and we kill this Axe. Then I run mid and I roll on this Invoker and I make him sad and I run back bot. Okay, not much happens here. I buy the Orb of Venom and the Tranquil Boots. Now I stack for my guy. I can test the bot room. We get the top room. I come back top. Not much to do here. I just take the bounty room. Um, I TP bot. We kill Mirana. But what you need to understand is that if we go back now in time and we watch this lane from Enigma's point of view, you can see that he's always keeping the lane in a very safe position because he knows he's playing 1v2. He knows that um, 
I'm going to be making a lot of good things happen elsewhere on the map, right? So he makes sure he doesn't click the creeps unless it's completely necessary. He's not just pushing out the way for no reason. He makes sure that he um, uses his demonic conversion. Right now, he can demonic conversion this creep, right? But he gets the next one instead. Because if he demonic conversions that one, the lane's going to be too far on this tower. And then it's going to bounce back the other way. In this case, because he demonic conversions the next one, he makes sure that the creep wave is relatively near his tower. He, he sees that this guy is going for a uh, stack, I think. Um, so now the lane is going to bounce back over here. Um, but pretty much the whole lane, the whole laning stage... He keeps the lane here and you can see he's not losing that much on last hits and we're winning the game in other places so always try to keep the lane here there's a lot of different ways to do it but it's just important to think about it and try to make it happen